Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Danny. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you, Michael? Really well, thank you. And I'm delighted that this is your first podcast and you've chosen to be on Share Your Story. I have. I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm really going to enjoy it because it's extra special for me. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Um, Danny, I will start with just one question, which I ask everybody, and that is, tell us about you. Where were you born? Where did you go to school? How was education for you? Uh, your first job? Was there a career? And then how did you get into what you're doing today? And then we can deep dive into all the amazing things that you're doing for people. So over to you. Okay, so start with where I was born. So I was born in Hastings on the south coast of England. So by the sea. Um, nice. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Um, I've got two brothers, two older brothers. Um, I'm the baby of the family. Um, so yeah I started off young childhood always been down by the sea always playing in the sea oh. holidays would always be by the sea I, yeah I was a proper water baby I guess you could say yeah and then started school um I suppose not much to really well not much I remember I suppose from primary <laughs> um I can't report much from that and then got into secondary school I went to boarding school um, there were a few issues with schools in my hometown, so my parents very kindly, I suppose, for for me to go to a boarding school. Yeah, for me to be able to get in there and get the support to be able to get in there. Um, and yeah, that's I suppose the first start of my education that I that I remember is going right. to to that boarding school. But being away from home was pretty tough. I to bet. start with yeah you know I didn't my brother was older but he'd already left by the time I got there and I was just there on my own I suppose mm. um, but but yeah I made friends everyone was in the same situation we were all you know thrown together away from home yeah um I had lots of fun got in a bit of trouble as you do at that age just because you're having lots of fun with your friends and yeah, staying up late yeah. when you probably shouldn't yeah um and then left there and went to university and just had this had this real desire to go somewhere completely different completely different to what what I knew what I'd grown up with so probably much to my parents upset at the time I I went to Sheffield right and applied at Sheffield to do sociology, got in, um, and yeah, and went to, to university. So I went straight from secondary school, doing A-levels, straight into university, didn't take that break, um, and moved five, six hours away from, from where I was to probably the most landlocked city that you could ever find. So gone from being a water <laughs> baby and always been by the sea to all of a sudden being nowhere near the sea um but it was and exciting was that, a, was, was that a conscious decision to get away from the sea no definitely no, no definitely definitely not I loved it I think it was more the conscious decision to go somewhere completely different you Just know to, applied... what, to get out Sorry. of your comfort zone <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Although I didn't know that at the time, but I suppose mm. looking back at it now, I think, yeah, I was just, yeah, just try something new. Um, yeah. Which is funny because I always, I always had this story that I was quite shy and I was a bit nervous as a kid, but I obviously had something inside me that was just, yeah, yeah just give it a go, do something totally different. And I was the first one in my family to go to university. So right. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't know, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know really what I was applying for, what I was setting myself up for, but I just thought, just, just do it and just go for it. And what about, you mentioned sociology. Well, yeah. How did that come about? 
Wow, that's a bit of an interesting story, really. So when I was at secondary school, my passion, and I suppose probably from quite a young age, was food. Food was a massive part of my family growing up. We always yeah. ate dinner together. You know, we very much um, lived to eat rather than it just being a necessity. Food was a massive part of our life. Yeah. And and I did that in my A level. So I did home economics and my A levels, really passionate about it and thought that's what I'm going to do when I go to university. And then I spoke to someone, I suppose who was helping us decide like what to do about university. And they said, Oh no, you've got to pick a really academic course. You can't go down that route. You won't be able to find a job afterwards. Right. I mean, when I think about it now. It was, it was awful advice that was given. Rubbish, um, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I listened to it and there was of no course. one else in my family who, who could advise anything different. So I thought, oh, okay, well, what else do I like? I'm interested in people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, in history. I'm interested in where people come from. And then the idea of sociology just evolved and that's what stuck. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah, I mean, it's it's ridiculous, isn't it, how we get not pushed, but kind of guided in a direction mm -hmm. and we're not really sure why we're mm -hmm. going in that direction. But I'm sure that as we progress, we're going to find out that it probably was a useful degree for you to have done. Yeah, y yes and no. I think... I think if, in all honesty, if I'd had my time again, I would have stuck with, with what I was passionate about. But right. I'm, I'm very much of that opinion. I can't change it. Everything no. set me on the path that has got me to where I am now. Yeah. But I did find it hard. I found it really hard. And I do wonder if that was because it was something that was really new to me. And it wasn't something that I had this really deep passion for. So I did find it hard when I got to university. Yes, you know, making friends and being in a new place, all of that. But it was the study that I found hard. The making yeah. new friends actually and being away from home wasn't that hard for me because I've been used to that at school. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I had lots of people around me who were really struggling with that. But I was like, this, this is this is the life I know. This it is was normal. more the study side. Yeah, it was normal for me. Yeah, I mean, I mean. I, I completely concur. I've never been to university, but I remember in my education, there was, because I grew up in the Netherlands and in South America and had kind of education split across different countries, but I was never passionate about any anything apart from learning English. Mm. And which as a Dutchman, you have to, because not many speak people speak Dutch so you've got to know how to speak English and so I agree with you you've got to be passionate about something mm. if you really want to make a go at it don't you yeah yeah definitely. okay so sociology in <laughs> yeah. Sheffield yeah um what happened next <laughs> <laughs> So I did my three years, I, I did my course, I did find it hard, I made some incredible friends, I worked alongside the whole time while I was there, so I did, I did bar work, you know, that cliche yeah. that we all do while, uh, while we're studying, um, and in the last, the last few weeks that I was in Sheffield, I'd already planned to move back down south afterwards, I, I love Sheffield, but I wanted to move back down south. I wanted to be by the sea again. Yeah. So I had planned to move back down to Brighton because I didn't want to go sh straight back to where, where I was uh, before I came to university. And I met a boy. <laughs> so, yeah, three weeks before leaving Sheffield, I met this boy and I had these plans and I thought, well, I'm, I'm still going to do it. I moved to Brighton. And we kept that relationship going long distance. So, you know, I'd come back up to Sheffield, he'd come down to Brighton. And, we, we, you know, we'd wait and see how, how that goes. And I suppose yeah. that's the next, the next step of the, the story. But I don't want to jump ahead to that yet. 
Okay. No, no, you go whatever direction you want to go. It's, it's your story. <laughs> so, so I moved down to Brighton. I started working for a bank and just working in debt collection. Not at all my dream job, but it, it paid the bills. I was renting, yeah. it paid the bills. It paid me enough money to be going out the weekends and seeing my friends. And, you know, it, it ticked all those boxes that I needed at the time. So there wasn't anything around the sociology that I'd done. There wasn't anything around my degree that I'd pulled into it. It was purely, let's get a job. Let's, you know, yeah. get, get paid. And I kept this relationship with uh, the boy at the time. And we did that for 18 months. And then I made the decision, okay, this could go one or two ways. We could get together properly and see what happens, or yeah. we could just leave it here. And I thought, why not see where it can go? So I moved back to Sheffield. Right. Even though I loved being by the sea, I loved being in Brighton. I was having lots of fun. But mm -hmm. yeah, my heart told me otherwise. So I followed that. I followed my intuition and I thought, I'll never know if I don't. So yeah, so I moved back to Sheffield. And I suppose the extended story of that is that we've been together ever since. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I had this horrible feeling that it wasn't going to work out. But... No, oh, that's a great. Nice happy ending there. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Oh, well, then it was worth it. Your intuition was right. So well yeah. done. Yeah. yeah, to be honest, I've some of the biggest decisions that I've made, I've made in that calm space of yeah. listening to my intuition. And it's never, never taken me to the wrong place. Oh, that's wow. That you're very lucky <laughs> in that yeah. respect, then. That's brilliant. So and do you get a chance to go back to the sea now and again? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I've got friends and I've got family still down that way. And they always laugh because whenever I go down, the first thing I want to do is to go to the sea. Yeah. 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 I'm just drawn to it. And it is on my it's on my vision for the future. I would love to move back to be by the sea. I think it it does something to you. It's yeah, it's a real balancer. Yeah. I used to go on holiday a lot to Florida uh, by the mm -hmm. sea. And yeah, for many, many years. I don't anymore, but I I remember meeting somebody who literally had property on the beach and this guy was an elderly guy and he just he just turned around to me out of the blue I, I, I didn't know who he was and we must have made a connection as I was walking past and he, he just said you know people that live by the sea live longer and I've never forgotten that <laughs> Yeah, just a random guy. <laughs> he was in his shorts, you know, no t-shirt, and he's like brown and windswept. You know, he's got like these sun lines, and he was just like, he must have been a hundred, probably. Who knows? <laughs> and he was just living his best life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I have that. to admit, I do like the sea as well. There is there is something magical about that. I mean. As human beings, I think most of us do. I mean, after all, we originated from the sea. So that's why we have this connection with it. <laughs> yeah, you know. that's so true. But okay. I'm so lucky where I live now. Sheffield mm -hmm. is a beautiful place. And if, yeah, if I wasn't going to live anywhere else, this is where I'd like to be. We're surrounded by a national uh, park, the Peak mm. District. So yeah. I drive 10 minutes away from where I live and I'm right out in the countryside with bouldering Wonderful. and yeah, hiking and it's, it's stunning. So I can't complain too much. I, there aren't many places in the United Kingdom where you're going to be disappointed in terms of, yeah. you know, the surroundings and countryside because you can always get there quite quickly. So amazing. Okay. So you're back in Sheffield. Yeah. Um, you, you gave up your bank job, debt collecting. What, yeah. happened, what happened next? <laughs> so I started another job working for a bank, a different bank, uh, when I first moved back to Sheffield. Again, wasn't my passion. It wasn't what I wanted to be doing. 
and I'd applied for another job and I was just waiting to start it and then a job had come up at one of the universities here in Sheffield at Sheffield Hallam yeah. and I thought I'm just going to go for it I've got this other job in the wings so I don't I don't need this but it sounds really interesting so I went for it and I suppose probably in that headspace that you know you never know what will happen I felt quite relaxed must have given a really good interview because they offered me the job so I, I turned down the other job that was debt collecting again which wasn't what I wanted to be doing and I took the job at Sheffield Hallam University. Doing what? So it was working in their registry department so it was working in their central services so right. it was doing like validation of courses so making sure that they were quality assured making sure that they were meeting the requirements for the students so it wasn't student facing but it was that it was part of the university I felt mm. like it was making that difference and I suppose because I'd gone through university as well I felt like I was there making a difference for students that were coming in to make sure that it was it you know it was quality assured they were yes. good courses they yeah. were looking after the students yeah brilliant and I think okay. that's when I first realized that that was something that really lit me up was something that that feeling like I was making a difference for other people. Got you. Yeah. Yeah. How long did you do that for? So I did that role at the university for three years and then got another job at the university in a student facing job. And that I just absolutely loved. I mean, it was chaos. It was absolutely <laughs> bonkers busy from the moment that I stepped through the door and started the job. It was my first management job. I was managing a team of seven and we were welcoming students. We were basically doing from welcome right through to graduation, supporting the right. students. So it was, yeah, it was full on, but it was amazing. I absolutely loved it. What, what was the bit that I can see you kind of smiling and, and thinking about it? What, what did you enjoy so much about it? I think it was having that interaction with the students and that that was challenging sometimes because sometimes it was students coming to you with problems that they had or things had, had gone wrong and they yeah. needed your help or things had gone wrong in their personal life and they needed your help. But it was that part of feeling like I was helping them. It was that support side that I just absolutely loved. Right. And... And I suppose also getting the experience of being a manager, which I hadn't had before. And again, that had its highs and lows as well. You know, there were definitely challenges and I had some interesting characters in my team. But I just love that. I love that opportunity to, to help people to grow, I suppose. Yeah. For, with their development. Did you get some training for the management role as well or not? Yeah, I, I did. I mean, not when I first got into it. And I suppose, I suppose, no, it's one of those things, isn't it? You become a manager, you need the management experience to become a manager. But I yes. guess they saw something in me that I had that potential to be able to do it. So I got support from my manager one to one, but it wasn't until I actually got into the job that they started with management training. Yeah. And I did feel quite supportive with that. I know people that have been in similar situations they've just been thrown you know thrown into the job and you just have to make it up as you go along I did get quite a lot of support so I, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm grateful for for that experience really yeah brilliant brilliant okay <laughs> so that that whole theme around helping and supporting people starting to come through now isn't it yeah yeah definitely it's so nice talking about it because I'm starting to piece it together as well you forget don't you you, you don't often look back and reflect on your life so this is lovely to do thank you Michael <laughs> it it's helpful sometimes to realize and connect all the dots and go mm -hmm. ah okay that's when it first happened yeah. that's where my interest got you know developed and you don't know at the time 
of course, where it's going to take you. You have no idea. Yeah. Um, okay. It's fascinating. I'm really enjoying the journey so far. So what, what happened next? Thank you. Yeah, so I, so I did that job. I was absolutely loving it. But then an opportunity came up with an academic who was in the faculty where I was working, and I'd worked quite closely with him. And he was launching this new project that was going to be a, a, new, a new project that was going to be in the faculty that was going to be around student support, but a lot more uh, autonomy, I suppose, about what that support would look like. So the idea was that we would work with, with other academics, we would work with students and find out what they needed, whether that would be career support, whether that would be well-being support, whether that would be personal development. And then we'd create that support package for them. Right. So it just it just sounded really exciting. And even though I was loving the job that I was doing, this was a, a big step up and that possibility of uh, opportunity, I suppose, of anything is possible. Yeah. You know, I could do, I could do anything to support those those students and support those course teams. So again, I I, t- I went for the job. I thought this will be really competitive. And there was going to be four of us that that uh, were working in the team, and I got one of the roles. Brilliant! So I couldn't believe it. I can still remember. You know, when you just have those really poignant rem- memories in your life, and yeah. I remember because I was in I was in France visiting my parents because they'd moved over there after I moved to back, um, after I finished university, and I was visiting my parents, and I got this phone call at eight o'clock in the morning. And I answered it and I remember the woman saying, do you still want the job? And I said, 100%. She said, well, it's yours. And it took all my energy not to scream down the phone because <laughs> I just, I felt so proud that I'd, I'd got this job that I felt yeah. was so out of my reach. Um, so, yeah, it was a really, really exciting moment. And it's, it's when there's an emotionally charged event that happens mm. in our lives our memory hardwires it and it can be bad or good (laughs) but if emotions involved it's the neurons hardwire and keep that because even if it's bad it's kept and it's kept in a place to protect you and also you know for good things that's also in some way to help you (laughs) and it's it's just so ridiculous how the brain does it you know why Mm -hmm. is the brain hardwiring these emotionally charged events to support us we've we've got all the you know the software running inside of our brain that is automatically doing these things i find that really fascinating because you got i could tell in your face you're really animated when you recall that memory and you were literally sitting or standing on the phone in you knew which room you were in you know the time of day whether it was dark or light you knew all of the circumstances because the brain is just hardwired it I find that just yeah amazing amazing yeah it's incredible yeah I feel like I could relive it all over again yeah yeah and it's it's a while ago that it happened but it stayed with you all that time. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So now you're doing this job. <laughs> so now I'm doing this job, still working at Sheffield Hallam University. And, and it was incredible in, in lots of ways. I learned so much from it. I was pushed massively out of my comfort zone in terms of what I was doing. I'd come from a job where everything was so structured and, you know, we were, we were quite regimented in what we were doing. We were very regimented in, you know, the, the timetable and the schedule. And I, for this new job, I was basically just given a blank piece of paper and a blank yeah. calendar and just told, just go off and do your job. Um, so, yeah, it, it threw me out of my comfort zone, very much so. And I had people that wanted to work with me. I had people that didn't want to work with me and were very vocal about that. It was, yeah, it was, it had massive highs and massive lows. 
but it was a it was a really exciting time it was something that I'd never done before and yeah. I was working directly with students and it did when it worked it felt like anything was possible mm. and when it worked and and I could do things you know do the projects I wanted to work on the feedback from the students was just incredible it felt like I was making a massive impact which yeah which was just everything to me so yeah it, it was amazing and then a year was it a year into the job just after just over a year into the job the university started to go through a restructure and we got told we we were separate we weren't going to get pulled into it but all our colleagues around us were getting, you know, pulled into this restructure. And all the way along, we were saying, you know, well, where are we going to sit in this new structure? It's OK. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Yeah. And then last minute, we got pulled into it. Yeah. And we got pulled into it after everyone else had. So there wasn't the jobs to go for that other people had had opportunities Mm. And we basically got told you've got a week to decide whether you want to go for these other jobs that are still available or whether you take redundancy. Yeah. So I decided to take redundancy. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Which was a, which now I think of, of course it was the right decision to make, but at the yeah. time was a really scary decision to make because I'd been at the university for like 11 years then and mm. you know I'd built up quite a reputation I'd you know I'd done lots of different things I was walking away from a career you know I had all these voices in my head like you've got to be sensible you've got a mortgage what are you doing your identity yeah yeah all of that all of yeah. that was tied up in it yeah um but my we were we were getting married that year and we thought the options actually, because I'd I'd get some money from the redundancy, yeah, is that we could take my husband would leave his job and we could go off traveling. Right. So that was the plan. So I took redundancy, I walked away from my career, my husband walked away from his career. We rented out our flats, which even that was just, yeah, just just seemed like a huge, huge thing to be doing. Yeah. And we packed up our bags after we got married and we went off traveling for nine months. Oh, amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Where did you go? So we spent six months traveling around India, traveling and doing some volunteering around India, and then yeah. went over to Thailand and Laos and Vietnam, and then back to Thailand and then back to the UK. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that must have been a real experience. India it was especially. incredible. Yeah. 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 We loved India. We'd been, we'd been two years before and that's where my husband had proposed. Oh, and right. we'd spent, we'd spent three weeks in India. Absolutely fell in love with it. Wanted to go back and spend more time. Yeah. And we had this um, volunteering project that we could work with. So we wanted to spend time and my sister-in-law and her husband were also in India at the time so we could meet up with them and then oh, wow. yeah it was just it was just amazing absolutely incredible and I, yeah I tell everyone and anyone go traveling just do it pack up and go <laughs> yeah absolutely when you can yeah do it <laughs> oh that's and did you have to give notice to your tenants or how did you do that? You know, you didn't know when you were coming back, did you? Well, we thought that we'd be gone. At, we thought we'd probably be gone 10 months. That's what we right. planned. But it was a, a friend's, well, a colleague that worked at the university who took the flat. Okay. And he was brilliant. He was really flexible because in the end we had to cut our, our trip short a little bit because my husband had problems with his back. So we ended up cutting it short by about a month and a half. And we came back and moved in with my mother-in-law up in the Northeast. And we, yeah, we stayed with her for a bit and then stayed with some friends for a little bit. We were nomads for, for a couple of months. <laughs> and then the, the person renting moved out and we moved back in. Okay. Fabulous. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So both incredible. of you now 
lovely to go on traveling and experience yeah. all that. Both of you are unemployed. Yeah. <laughs> back in the flat. Yeah. <laughs> having to pay the mortgage. Yeah. Quick, back to banking, Danny. No, no, I didn't go back to no, I didn't go back to banking. I went back to the university. So I got I got a job at the students' union at Sheffield Hallam. So I got a job there. My husband basically walked back into his his role that he had wow. before the, the company uh, gave him his job back. So yeah. He he was very, he was luckier than me. I had to apply for a lot of jobs before I got my uh, my job at the university. But he uh, he stepped back into the old company, which mm. was which was good. Yeah. So I was back working at the students' union. So at the at the university that I knew, but the students' union was a totally different way of working. Yeah. It it felt very different to me, but I still had that that experience of working with students. So that was really good. I was working on a fixed term contract, maternity cover for someone. So I did that for a year. Yeah. And then I left there and went to the other university in Sheffield and did another year contract there. Yeah. But had to leave that early because I was pregnant <laughs> and expecting our first child. So, yeah. Great. Okay, well, that was a valid reason to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Okay. So then it's maternity leave, um, going through change with having to look after somebody to be responsible for someone. And then what happened next after all that? So I took quite a long break after having my little boy. I So we went through IVF to have my son. So we went from thinking we might not ever be parents, we might not ever be able to have a child to being successful and, and having my beautiful little boy and had the most incredible pregnancy, loved being pregnant, even had a really good birth, which I have to whisper because I know that's that's not that's not everyone's uh, no. experience. Very grateful. It was it was incredible. And then after I had my little boy, my mental health really deteriorated, and I really struggled with what I didn't know at the time, but later, really late, got diagnosed with postnatal depression and anxiety. Yeah. And yeah, hit a really, really tough time. My husband was working away. So he would leave the house on a Monday morning at like three, four o'clock in the morning. And he'd come back on Wednesday or Thursday. And we didn't have any family. My parents lived in France. My yeah. my mother-in-law was in the Northeast. And I was just, I just felt really isolated. Yeah. And compounded by really severe lack of sleep. And a mm. child who had reflux, so would struggle to settle. Yeah. It yeah, it was it got really bad. Yeah, that's tough. That's tough. And mm -hmm. when you say it was later diagnosed, so how long were you suffering without knowing what was going on for you? It was about 18 months. Wow. When it got diagnosed. Yeah. I had I had a health visitor that was around it was around my son's first birthday and came to visit. And I just I just remember saying to her, when does it get better? Like, when mm. when when am I gonna be able to sleep? Like when when am I gonna feel normal again? Mm. And they have a list of questions that they have to ask you, like a tick sheet to see if there's any concerns there. And she went through this list and she said, I think you might have postnatal depression. And she said, I'm going to I'm going to refer you back to the doctors. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then she left and I got a new health visitor. And when they came to visit, I'm guessing those notes just disappeared because they they came and they said, the baby's fine. You're fine. Everything's fine. Huh? And I, I really struggled with asking for help. I really struggled with 
we've been able to reach out, we've been able to accept that that I was finding it hard. So I, I just I was just quiet. I just didn't say anything and I just mm. left it. Which I now know that wasn't the right thing to do. But at the time yeah. I was just in such a, a bad place that I just didn't know. I just didn't know the way out of it. And I carried on. So that was the that was just after Isaac's first birthday and I carried on carried on really struggling find it really hard was having panic attacks just in a really really bad place and then after one particular bad day it was it was as if it was just the straw that broke the camel's back and I just remember breaking down and just I went to the doctors and I just got to the reception at the doctors with my little boy and just said I'm not leaving here until someone helps me Mm. and I just thought something needs to change something needs to change either I'm not yeah. you know something needs to change for me otherwise yeah. I might not be here and this you know I might not be here with my family yeah so so yeah so I sat there and the doctor the doctor knew a little bit about things that were going on and they put me on tablets and they got me referred to go and see someone and that's when I got diagnosed with postnatal depression and anxiety yeah wow yeah and it's you know I mean it's normal isn't it I mean when I say it's normal these things happen regularly to millions of women around the world and yet the system (laughs) isn't there by the sounds of it properly yet to support it or to you know support it properly and I think mental health there is a lot of stigma still I believe around mental health mm. and we all have you know issues with our mental health through our lives I mean that's part of being human we only focus on the physical parts of health not so much of what happens in the mind and it's such a shame because if we focus more on the mental side, the physical side would take care of itself as well. Um, mm. So, yeah, I'm really sorry you went through all that suffering. And it's really sad to hear that you had to suffer for that long. But I'm also delighted that you, your intuition did kick in again and that you were able to, you know, confront it. So well done to you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, f- I feel really grateful that that I'm here that I'm you know that I am okay because for a long time when all of that was happening I just thought well I'm feeling like this because I'm not supposed to be a mum I'm finding this really hard because because I'm not good enough yeah there were a load of stories that came up from stories that I had as you know growing up and yeah all of that came to the forefront and you know, I realise now I was finding it hard because it was hard. Yeah. You know, not because I wasn't good enough, not because I wasn't supposed to be a mum. I was finding it hard because it was really hard and anyone would find it hard. There is a massive, there is a lot of research about what lack of sleep does to us Mm. in terms of our perception of what is real and what isn't real. And when you're in that constant fog of not having had enough sleep and, you know, being awake in unsociable hours, not getting that full rest that your body and your brain needs to recharge and, you know, um, yeah, basically, what do they say? It's it's you know, there's a reason why we have to, our physical body has to sleep because it has to detoxify, has to detoxify physically in your body, but also your brain mentally detoxifies as well. And when that can't happen, you make all sorts of rubbish up in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Which isn't real. And that's, that's just the physically physiological effect of what happens of lack of sleep, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember saying to my brother, I said, I've just got to evolve, you know, like, like he was, I've just got to evolve and adapt so I don't need sleep. You know, that's what I was thinking. I've just oh, got to adapt to this. Wow. Because that's that's all I thought that 
that was the only thing I thought I could do because I thought mm. there's no way out of this. I, I, look, I thought I'm never going to sleep again. I just need to evolve and adapt to it. My body just needs to adapt to, you know, to, so that I can survive and not getting sleep. I mean, I was waking up every hour. That's what my son was doing. He was waking up every hour. And he would sleep in the daytime, but he would only ever sleep. He'd sleep in the pushchair or he'd sleep when he was in the sling on me or he'd sleep in the car. I remember, I remember one of the helpers just saying to me, why don't you just sleep when they sleep? And I said, okay, is that while I'm driving the car or pushing the pushchair? I said, what do you mean? I said, that's the only time he's sleeping. You know, how can I do that? Mm. Uh, yeah nothing was picked up you know that was a different health sister and nothing was picked up then and yeah uh, I've got to take responsibility because I I should have asked for help but I didn't know I didn't know what was going on with me I'd, yeah. I'd had depression when I was younger when I was when I was in my teens into um university time but this was totally different this mm. was this was an excess of energy it was like I can't sit still it was it was it was manic I suppose was like yeah. the best way to describe it yeah so did the pills work help you what helped in the end they did they did help and I went to see a counsellor who the first session that I went to see her and I said I explained my situation and I said but it's not because I'm not sleeping <laughs> I, I still had in my head that everything was because of me or something I was doing wrong. And then about six months into us working together and I was sleeping a bit more and she said, do you still think it's nothing to do with sleep? And I said, yeah, the sleep is helping. Um, so yeah, it, it was a mixture of the tablets helped, getting some sleep helped, working yeah. with a counsellor and working through, you know, a lot of quite deep rooted stuff that I had that came up during that time. But the big shift came for me then when I started working with a life coach. Yeah. Because I realized then that I wasn't broken, that I didn't mm. need fixing. My perception of myself and therefore the world around me was really skewed. Yeah. And that's what working with a life coach helped me to see that okay. actually I, when I changed that and when I changed my belief about myself and so therefore the belief of my outside world I could change the way that I was seeing things yeah yeah I I, I remember this famous quote from Wayne Dyer and that was when you change the way you look at things the things you look at change <laughs> yeah oh it's a beautiful and it gives me goosebumps that quote because that yes. just yeah it's a beautiful one Michael because that just epitomizes for me what what coaching is but also my my journey for so long I was going down that rabbit hole of negativity self-doubt lack yeah. of self-belief I'm rubbish I'm broken I'm not enough yeah and when I changed that way of looking at that it was like every you know I awakened and the thing is, it's and 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 thank you for sharing this story. And you know, I hope people that are listening to this will, you know, reflect on it themselves because every human being walking on the planet will go through this at some point through their lives. You know, that's yeah. part of that's part of being human. It's part of our suffering journey. Um, we do have to experience it in order to realize, you know, that we are good enough. Um, yeah. All of us are. All of us are. Yeah, always. And yeah, I suppose just carrying on from that, that if there is anyone listening, and if I could go back and tell myself this as well, I would. But yeah. just ask for help. You know, it's not it's not a weakness there's no shame in it there's no guilt in it just ask for help we're not supposed to do this all on our own no you know we're we're humans we're supposed to we're social beings so we're supposed to have that connection mm. and when I reached out and got the help that I needed everything changed 
Brilliant. Everything changed. So yeah, I just recommend anyone who's listening, whatever you've got going on, just reach out for that help. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. So after the experience of life coaching, then that inspired you to do something different? Yeah, well, not quite, not quite then. Um, right. I would love to say that it was a quick switch and, you know, everything changed, but it wasn't. It was a long journey, I suppose, to get to where I am now. So mm. I started working with a life coach. I then got uh, another job and I was working at the students union still, but doing a, a different job. And that was around personal development with students. And I started doing some coaching aspects of that, which I really right. enjoyed. And alongside that, I'd started on my own personal development. I've been doing some group programs. I started doing um, some meditation programs. I'd started to, I suppose, like work on my own toolkit a bit more. Yeah. And alongside that, my, my job was kind of aligning to that personal development as well, which, I, you know, was bringing me back into that student facing, helping students, which I just, I just loved. And then the pandemic hit. Ah. Oh. <laughs> yes um which yeah I suppose just led a lot of us to to go really inward and to look at what we're doing and to assess yeah. what we're doing and my mental health took a dip again working from home homeschooling juggling all of that at once mm. Mm. I started to really struggle again and um yeah I uh Long story short, a friend had put me in touch with someone who was doing this challenge uh, about um, how to live in flow, how to come back to yourself, to be grounded and to um, live life in flow. And I started yeah. following her and she talked about becoming a life coach. And again, my intuition kicked in and those synchronicities. And I just thought I need to contact this woman and find out who she trained with. Yeah. And I contacted her, fell in love with her story, what she was talking about. And I, I trained to become a life coach off the back of that. So mid pandemic, mid homeschooling and doing my job, I thought this is, this is what I need. This is what's going to light me up. And it did. It just absolutely. Yeah. It's when I discovered Wayne Dyer. It's when, yeah, it was when I discovered so much about myself. And I train to be able to share that with others. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah. And I read on your website, you specialize. Do you specialize in certain things? Because meditation is a big part of what you do as well. Yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah. So I qualified as a meditation teacher last year as well to do that alongside my coaching. Right. Because that was a massive game changer for me. I always yeah. thought I've got a really anxious mind. I can't meditate and, no. uh, until I could. And then I realized that that was an excuse that I was telling myself. So I bring that into my practice. So I do the meditation and coaching together, but also the meditation on its own. But my my big focus is around self-love and self-worth. Yes. So I realized that when my life started to change, was when I started to love myself when I started to love myself when I started to believe in myself when I started to realize that I was worthy of having that life that I wanted to have yeah and then I could start creating it oh that's amazing that's brilliant thank I you love that. that's awesome well done you big thank virtual you. high five uh, <laughs> double high five you. that's just amazing to hear that Thank you. Um, well so I you. feel I feel so lucky because and so many people and yeah, you know, I had a tough time at the beginning of the pandemic as well with juggling everything. But I know people had such a tough time. Yeah. You know, when all of that was going on. But for me, that was like my period of like awakening. That was when I discovered my passion and what I now know is my purpose. Yeah. Is going out yeah. and doing this. So yeah, I feel so grateful. And are you and are you working with, you know, a particular group of people, audience that you would like to attract? Yeah, I tend to work with women, more women, although I am working with two men at the moment, two yeah. male clients. I tend to work with women because that's my known experience. Yeah. I, I find that 
that they're more drawn to me I suppose we attract yes. don't we um that mirror image yeah um and I guess I also I know that I, I'm I'm not uh, discounting men but I know from my no. own experience that working with women if I can get that message across around self-love and self-worth you know we we nurture and we share and when we nurture and share that message that we find yeah. in ourselves we share that with our families with our children with our colleagues with our friends and it's that beautiful ripple effect you know I I'd, I'd love to be able to help thousands of women who can then go out and help thousands more yeah brilliant and I I I think you're absolutely right I mean men also need self-love yeah 100% um there's lots of men well we know you know the rate of suicides in young men is very high yeah. and in this country and but I just watched recently came out on BBC three the Instagram effect mm. I highly recommend you watching it for your education mm -hmm. and awareness for young women and there were all young women portrayed in <clears throat> their mental health and you know what Instagram did for them now there mm -hmm. might have always been underlying stuff going on but Instagram really helped it to get worse if you know what I mean mm -hmm. and um, it's it's a fascinating bit of research I mean, I researched it because I have this particular anti, as they're now called, meta, and what they're doing to the world. You know, talking about dictatorships in the world, they're a massive dictator, unfortunately, in the way that we operate. But that's a whole other story for another day, Danny. <laughs> uh, I know you've got to rush in a few minutes. Um, Please share with the listeners how they can get hold of you if they want coaching, meditation or anything else that you're doing and how they can connect with you. Thank you. So you can find me on on Instagram. So I'm Danielle Louise Coaching on Instagram. That's also how you can find me uh, for my website. I'm also on LinkedIn as Danielle Fonton Walker. So, yeah, I just love people to be able to reach out. I think. I find sometimes that that people, when we talk about self-love, it's, oh, that's a bit fluffy, you know, oh, I don't really need that. But it's the essence, it's the building blocks for everything. Because if we don't believe in ourselves, if we don't love ourselves, then we're not going to go out and get the opportunities that we want. We're not going to no. look at a job and think, oh, I could go for that. We're not going to give ourselves the rest and the, the the space that we need to you know to to care for ourselves we're going to burn out we're going to be overstretched we're going to not going to have boundaries in place unless we start loving ourselves and yeah. knowing that we are worthy of that and when we start with that and we get those building blocks right life just gets so much brighter so much yeah. brighter and I know yeah. because I've lived it and that's that's the thing, isn't it? Having gone through the journey that you went through, having come out the other end and realized all of that, you would never have been able to support other people going through the same if you hadn't done it yourself and had the experience, yeah. you know, being able to have that empathy and understanding in the yeah. first place is so important to be able to coach people. I mean, I, you know, in terms of coaching, it depends what type of coaching you do. But if it's non-directive, people do it themselves. You're just there to guide them with the right questions. But yeah. Even so, having that empathy and knowledge is is massively important. So, uh, yeah, I'm so glad you've got to this place where you're now sharing, you know, that message with other people. And uh, yeah, I hope you get lots of inquiries on the back of this. <laughs> thank you thank you so much for today michael i've loved it my pleasure i really thank you so much for being so open and authentic and sharing your story um i hope it will really help lots of women out there
Thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for supporting me through my first podcast. Thank you for being on my podcast for the first time. <laughs> yeah, that's really awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And I'll catch up with you soon. Take care for yeah. now. Thanks, Michael. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests. So do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.